Hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is Armand Hezerkani, and today I'm going to be talking to you all about cloud. So to start out, my name, oh wait, is that the, OK, cool. So I'm going to be talking about cloud. So first of all, my name is Armand. I'm a student at Carnegie Mellon University, and I'm going to be a senior in the fall. I study electrical and computer engineering. And as Damien mentioned, I'm the head TA for one of the biggest computer science courses at that school. Um, this slide isn't correct, but I'm just going to keep going. Um, so in addition to that, I'm an intern at Google. So currently, I'm what's called a developer programs engineer. And what that means is that I write code every single day. The code I write, however, is not for production. So well, the code I write doesn't go into Google Cloud Platform. The code I write is basically to enhance the developer experience. So I would write a code sample that would go on GitHub, and developers could see and learn how to use a specific API. And so this is my second DPE internship at Google. Uh, this year, I'm on G Suite, which many of you know and love. And last year, I was on GCP. Uh, but I was specifically in the context of EDU. So I have experience talking to not only students, but also a lot of faculty members, CTOs, and CIOs of universities about how to get GCP in a university. And so today, I'm going to be talking about GCP, and I'm going to be answering three questions for you all. First of all, I'm going to answer, what is cloud? And so who here has heard of cloud? Right. We hear it every day. We hear all these new startups spinning up that are going to be uh, cloud-based startups, and they love that buzzword, right? And we, we hear every day that cloud is going to be very important to our futures. But a lot of us don't actually know what cloud truly is. And so I'm going to hopefully clarify some of the misconceptions and a lot of the uh, questions that we have in our heads about what is cloud. In addition to that, I'm going to say, what is GCP? So I just introduced cloud, and then I'm going to plug GCP into that mix. So how do GCP's tools fit into this idea and story of cloud that I've just told? And lastly, I'm going to answer the question, how do I get started? So you all have laptops out. That's great, because we're actually going to get hands-on, and we're going to log into the console, and we're going to spin up a virtual machine. So everyone's moving. You don't need to get them out yet. I will tell you when. For now, just sit back, relax, take some notes. As Aaron was saying, you can take out a pen and pencil the old-fashioned way. But for now, we're just going to be talking. And so the first question I'm going to answer, as I said, is what is cloud? So before I answer that question specifically, let's talk about a little bit of history. So I'm going to go through three different stages of like how companies and people use computers. And then it's going to end, as you can see, in cloud. And then we're going to get into what that actually is. So first of all, we're going to talk about the, the world as we used to know it, which is when companies were in the on-premise world. So basically, this is back in the day. Let's say I'm a startup, and I'm spinning up the newest like, social media uh, website. Let's call it like facenotebook.com or something. And I have five users. At that point, I have one server sitting in my closet, and I have one person just managing that server. Right? Everything's fine, because I only have five users. The next day, though, word spreads, and I have 1,000 users. And then my website keeps crashing. And I'm like, why is that happening? And does anyone know the answer? It's because I only have one server, right? And one server is not going to handle that traffic. So I have to do something called scaling. And nowadays, we think about scaling. And again, that's another buzzword that uh, startups used to, love to use. But back in the day, scaling was this. It was I had to go to a store, buy a brand new computer, put it on top of the other computer in my closet, download code on that, do a bunch of other stuff to add it to my network, and then I could now handle 1,000 users. And that took almost an entire day. That was a huge headache. And so like, that was just, that, that's basically one of the things that led to cloud. But so that pain point is what led to the next thing called time sharing. So we have startups that are, have these computers. But on the other side of the aisle, we have these huge companies. Think like IBM, right? And they, they have a lot of money. They can buy gigantic sets of computers. They don't need to guess and say, OK, I have 1,000 users today. What if I have a million tomorrow, and then I'm going to buy that many computers to basically manage that scale? IBM, they could just go out and buy a million computers, right? But what if they over budgeted, and now they have like 200 computers that are not being used? Then one smart person said, hey, let's rent these out. Let's allow other, com other companies, like these startups, to rent out these computers for certain amounts of time so that 
then it's cheaper for them, and we're making passive income. And so that's how we got to the idea called time sharing. And then this got more and more popular, and then that just became mainstream. It became very normal for startups, smaller companies, to go to large companies and rent out their computers for a certain amount of time. And then after a while, these bigger companies said, oh, what if we can make more money off of this time sharing thing? What if we provided additional services on top of this infrastructure that we're selling? And these additional services, this suite of services that was created is what's called cloud. And so I didn't necessarily get into the details of how people use cloud, but now I'm going to get into that to hopefully clarify what cloud really is, go into lev one level deeper. So cloud is oftentimes broken up into three different like, umbrellas of tools. And so the first set of tools is what's known as infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service, that's time sharing. That is, I have a computer, and I'm not using it all the time, so let me sell it for a certain amount of time to these other companies. I have storage disks. Let me sell this infrastructure. Right? It's literally hardware that you can touch and feel. So I'm selling that. And then, as I said, these companies said, what if we can add additional tooling to this infrastructure? What if, instead of saying, OK, I have 10 users today, and then I have 100 users tomorrow, and making the companies manually scale that on our network, what if we just had a tool that said, hey, startups, whether you have 10 users or a million users, we will handle that for you. You just need to write the code for your website, and we will fully scale for you. So that's basically infrastructure plus a little bit of magic. That's what those star I, I throw those stars up there to like throw a little bit of magic in the background, right? Because it's basically infrastructure with some software involved, but it's quite magical. I like to think of it that way at least. And then lastly is software as a service. So these are basically tools that you know. Um, think Google Docs, Google Drive, Slides and Sheets. There are also other companies that are in the software as a service space, like Salesforce, for example, if you've heard of them. And so this is basically, these are the three different tiers or three different umbrellas of cloud. So now, what is cloud? Right? I basically just gave some background. Then I talked about the three umbrellas. So what is it? In one sentence, cloud is a set of tools that helps you spend less time managing and spend more time creating. So let me say that again. Cloud is just a set of tools that helps you, the developer, spend less time managing and more time being creative as a developer. So I don't need to hire an entire staff to scale my infrastructure. I can just pay Google a little extra money, and they'll fully scale for me. So I don't need to put time into that. I can put time into building new features, talking to my customers. That's what cloud is. And so now, what is GCP? GCP is obviously a cloud tool, but it's many things. And so before I get into the specifics of GCP, let me talk about Google Cloud as a whole. So Google Cloud is the mixture of both GCP on the right and G Suite on the left. And so GCP, in, in a basic sense, is the infrastructure and platform as a service side of the house. So those are things like, like, like I said, infrastructure and platform, where you can run code, store data, things like that. And then G Suite, as you all probably know, is things like Google Docs, Google Drive. That is the software as a service side of the house. And so within the umbrella of Google Cloud, this is how we divide things up. On the right in GCP land, we have infrastructure and platform. And on the left, we have software. Today, we're only talking about GCP. But as you all probably know, G Suite also has a ton of APIs that you can use to enhance the GCP experience. And they use a lot of the same consoles, for example. And so you should really look into that as well. So on GCP, you can do a lot of things. First of all, you can run code. So you can spin up a virtual machine, and you can literally just run a giant script that'll take a week. Instead of running it on your own computer and worrying about the battery dying and this and that, you can just put it on a virtual machine in the cloud. Or you can deploy a web application and have the code run on cloud. You can store data. So we have SQL databases. We have NoSQL databases. We have file storage. All of these things I use almost every single day to build web apps, all these tools. And again, it's mostly all fully managed and fully scaled. 
We have tools for data migration. So this is for like companies that have a bunch of data in, let's say, disks in some closet somewhere, and they want to get that information onto the cloud. We have tools that allow people to do that. We have tools for networking. So in less than a minute, you can spin up a worldwide network, literally from here to India. I could spin that up in less than a second. We have tools for networking. I mean, uh, sorry, for monitoring. So let's say you have all these tools in your cloud, in your platform, and you want to monitor how they're working. If one thing crashes, let's see why that happened. We have tools that allow you to do that. We have tools that help you build Internet of Things projects. So you should look into IoT Core. Also, we have tools that help administrators manage this entire platform, because projects like we're going to see later on with big companies like uh, Spotify and Coca-Cola. They have a lot of stuff going on in their cloud, so they need some way to manage all of that. And we have tools that help people do that. We have tools to build your own APIs called Apiary and other things. And lastly, we have tools that help you uh, build security and administration into your platform. So you can say, okay, I have user data in my SQL table. I don't, my entire company doesn't need to see what's going on in there. So you can manage who can see what within your platform using the IAM and admin tools. We also have some open source tools, like TensorFlow, which is, we have some sessions on that. It's a machine learning platform, totally open source. Many other companies use it as well. We have Kubernetes, as well as other uh, open source tools that help with security and management as well. So now I've gone over what is cloud, and I've talked about what GCP is. So now we're going to talk about how some companies are actually deploying these tools and using them to help them spend less time managing and more time creating more. So if we could just play the video now, that'd be great. We wanted to make this marketing campaign for Coca-Cola something that every single person in this world, no matter who you are, could participate in the World Cup experience. Submit your photo, you can be on the pitch at the opening ceremony of the World Cup. We're talking about three million and a half images from over 200 countries, different formats, different users, different sources. Fans could actually find their photo to know, OK, I was here on the flag in the opening of the World Cup. It was a gigantic scale. The agency that was creating the photo mosaic printed in fabric, we recreated the equivalent digitally. We did not have time to set up an infrastructure and set up the servers and configure the machines. By using Google Cloud Platform, we went straight into building on top of it. Without that, my first deliverable would be impossible. You have to predict what the loads are going to be. There's a lot of uncertainty. When you look at a cloud provider like Google, the opportunity there is for auto-scaling. You don't have to worry about disaster recovery. You don't have to worry about backup because it's provided to you as a service. We wanted to send everyone that had an image in that flag, a notification, in the very moment the flag was opened physically in the field. We would have a lot of people doing that simultaneously. They're not taking turns to use it. So we were monitoring the transmission on TV and waiting. I remember clearly seeing these spikes and just hoping, please, please scale up, scale up. <laughs> and it did. Fundamentally, it gets down to one thing, and it's one word, it's trust. The same infrastructure that powers the Google search engine and search experience is what's powering the cloud that Coca-Cola is running on. The biggest digital market initiative. To participate is like a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. <laughs> I heard someone trying to clap. You can go ahead and clap. All right, one more over here. Okay, anyway, so who's heard of Coca-Cola? Right, so Coca-Cola, one of the biggest companies on the face of the earth, put their biggest marketing campaign in history in the hands of Google, and as you saw, it went very, very successfully. And so that's just one example. And now we're gonna see another one. So let's see how Spotify used GCP to enhance the music experience for everybody. Can we roll the, the mission okay. of Spotify is really about being a great musical companion and making it more personal. It's not going to be the streaming music experience or the online music experience. It's going to be your music experience. We create the tools for people to actually swim in that sea of music data and find the information that really corresponds to why they're there. 
Quite a while ago, we've made a decision to focus on data. Depending on the complexity of the query, it could take a whole day. Sometimes it would have to run overnight. And being able to store that and process that has been a very big challenge. Moving to Google's Cloud Platform enabled us to take use of the skill that Google can provide. The reality is it's quite hard to build great data centers, and we saw an opportunity to spend our focus elsewhere. And that was really the driver into Google's Cloud Platform. With Google Cloud Tools, we can rerun the same query, and it might take a few seconds, minutes. The less time that we can spend solving problems that are already solved, like scaling our Hadoop cluster when Google has already figured out how to scale it for us, the more time and energy we can spend on turning our data into value. And that's really a game changer for us. When you're talking about a technology like BigQuery, when you're talking about Dataflow, you will feel the Spotify product evolve, making the user experience great. Once you break down the data, you realize that there are nuances. It's not a straightforward path. It's a mosaic rich beyond the most popular artists. It's a lot more than that. Music can transcend boundaries of language, culture. If it moves you, then it's there, and it's there forever. So Spotify, another gigantic company that we all use, put their success in Google's hands. They used Google's tools to basically get a bunch of their data from users and provide tools to their users like the Daily Mix or whatever else playlists that are custom made for you. And they, if you heard in the video, basically the CTO said, why would we try to solve a problem that's already been solved? Google was building the biggest search engine in the world and as a matter of fact, they just built one of the greatest data centers, or one of the greatest sets of data centers in the world. So why would another company put time into doing that when they could just put more time into creating? And so that's how companies use GCP. But how are students using GCP? That's what we're worried about today, right? So now we're going to go through some projects that students actually built, and we're going to see what tools they used. So first, I'm going to talk about a tool that we found at the University of Arizona at a hackathon called Hack Arizona. So a few of us were at the um, hackathon, and we were judging. And we saw this group of students. It was about three students, and they were freshmen. <clears throat> and they had just gotten back from a trip to Europe. And they were telling us about the horror stories of finding tickets to and from Europe. If anybody's ever tried to find tickets to Europe as a student, you know how difficult it is to find tickets that are within our budget. And they basically wanted to solve this tool using technology. And so they showed up to this hackathon and they said, how can we build a tool that will allow students to find cheap flights to and from Europe? And if you know anything about um, like searching for flights, you know that there's an API out there, or a few APIs out there, where you can literally scour the internet for every flight that's out there. It includes where it's going from and where it's going to. It includes the price, the times, all the information you need. And so they basically queried this uh, API. And now they had a gigantic data set and a very difficult problem. Because parsing this, uh, basically it's like a tree, right? It's like a tree with nodes of different places where you're going. And parsing this and trying to find the cheapest flight, that's what's called the traveling salesman problem. And that is a very, very computationally heavy problem, as some of you may know if you study CS. And so they thought, how are we going to do this? Because no one's ever solved this problem in less than exponential time. And so it's very, very computationally heavy. Let's just throw it on Google Cloud's VMs. They spun up a, like the biggest and most expensive virtual machine that we had. It had like 16 cores or something. It was insane. But they spun it up. And when you go onto this web application, you don't even notice that it's doing this gigantic search because of how strong and powerful Google's infrastructure is. And the code that they wrote was also pretty efficient. And so that's one example of a thing that we could all use, and we all could have thought of as well, but it relies on GCP to make it usable, to make it something that we would actually use, and it saves us time. Next, I want to talk about a team that was from Columbia University. They were basically solved with this problem, which is how do we allow two people to communicate if one person is typing and one person is on the phone. And so the, uh, the problem that they very quickly faced was what language do these two users speak to each other? And I'm not talking about like spoken language. I'm talking about 
one person's writing, the other one's speaking, literally, how do we put these two together? And they also found GCP at this hackathon, and this is what they came up with. So this is a diagram of the stack that they built, and I'm basically gonna walk through what's going on here. So on the top right, you'll see Twilio. That's another company that builds an API that allows you to use cell phones via code, basically. And it, built, it spins you up a phone number, and so you can call, you can text, and do a bunch of things from, from the API. On the left, we have Hangouts Chat, which is a Google product, and then we have Messenger, which is a Facebook product. Those are both chat messaging apps. So let's start with the right. Let's start with how do I allow a user to speak and turn that into text and send that over to a chat uh, room? So, so we start with Twilio sending a um, request, basically, to an instance, which is basically a virtual machine or just like a computer um, on Google Compute Engine. So they had a server running on Google Compute Engine that was running a Flask server. So Flask is a Python um, framework, and it basically accepts this request from Twilio. And now they have audio message. They have an audio file that they then send to Google's speech-to-text API. And Google, this API basically uses Google's deep learning. It's a fully trained model. All you need to do is basically call a method in your code that says, almost literally, turn this speech into text. So it does that, and then it sends the text back. And then now, in this server, we have text, which is basically just a string, and then we send that to another server that's also running a Flask app, but that handles the text side of this stack. And then once we have the text over there, we send that up to the chat rooms, wherever, whoever this person is speaking to. So now, using this API and using uh, the Google Compute Engine instance, we were able to turn voice into text. So now let's go the other way around. So we, we get text into the server, and then we send that into the text-to-speech API. And if any of you saw the presentation that Sundar, our CEO, gave at, um, I think it was Google I.O., then you probably saw the fully, um, like, the, the speaking robot. They were using this deep learning model, which basically turns text into very recognizable speech. It, it sounds like you're talking to a person. And so we call that API, which sends us back this audio. We send that audio to the other server, which sends it to Twilio and will respond on the phone. And so now we have a fully, uh, like, we have a full communication platform between text and uh, speech, so we have a little check mark there. We just accomplished that, check. So this team built this in a hackathon using our tools. And if any of you know about hackathons, which you do, they're usually under 36 hours. So it means that these tools are pretty easy to use if somebody could just get it done in under 36 hours. And so we're very proud of this team. They built something really cool, and these were two examples of something that students built. And it's basically up to y'all, too, to get these tools into the hands of students throughout the next year. And we're really excited to see what other projects we can find from your work. And lastly, how do I get started? So now we're actually going to get our hands dirty. Now it's time to take out your laptops. And as we're going through this demo, there are going to be some helpers walking around <clears throat> and basically answering questions if you have them. Um, and in addition to that, you each have a coupon code in front of you, which looks something like this. And on the side of this coupon code, you'll see a little yellow bar with a number. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But so we're, right now, we're going to do four things. First, we're going to log in. Then we're going to make a project. And I'll explain what that means. We're going to create a billing account. And then we're going to create a VM. So now I'm going to log on to my computer. And we're going to do all these things. So if we could just get the computer on the screen, please. OK, cool. So this is my computer. Um, so first and foremost, um, I would like you all to log on to console.cloud.google.com. So I'll type it in with you, console.cloud.google.com. And then just press Enter. And you'll come to a page that says Access Forbidden, OK, that will look a little bit, I'll just come here that will look a little bit like this, but it'll have some other stuff saying, sign up for a $300 credit. Um, it might say that if it's your first time logging onto the console. But I've already logged onto this, so it looks like this. The first thing we're going to do, also, if you haven't logged in, just use like a Gmail account. 
So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say select a project. And then now we have all these different projects. And so what is a project? Let's say I'm a company and, or a student and I'm working at a hackathon and I want to build that um, flight tool. So within that flight tool they had an, uh, a web app running, they had some storage instances running, and they had a few different Google Cloud Platform resources. So the way that we house that all together with the permissions and everything is in a project. So it's quite intuitive. A project is a project. So to make a project, we click on New Project. And what, we, what it's asking us for is a project name. You can name this anything you want. And if you're like incorrect or are not in the correct format, it'll tell you. And then you can change it. But so I'm just going to stay with the default. And then it's going to say no organization. That's fine for now. And then create. And so what it's doing right now is it's basically making my project. It takes a minute because it needs to propagate through all the systems. But as we wait for that to happen, um, again, if you have any questions, there are people standing around who can answer your questions. So feel free to raise a hand if you need it. So now we have our project. As you can see, this is our dashboard. And right now, it is fairly empty. There is no sign of any errors for the whatever. It's all empty. right? And so the way, so as you use it, this stuff will get filled up with some monitoring and some tools that will help you see all of your resources at a glance. But the one thing I'm going to highlight right now is at the top left of the screen. So up here, we see project info. And I can zoom into this a couple uh, clicks as well. So we have three pieces of information. The two most important are at the top, and the one most important is right in the middle, and that is your project ID. So your project name is not universally um, unique, but the project ID is. And so the project ID, oftentimes, when you're using GCP tools, you'll be asked for it. And the way that you'll find that is you'll just click on Google Cloud Platform, which will bring you back to the dashboard. You'll make sure that you're in the correct project, and then you'll just find it right here. So if you, ever need, if you ever need your project ID, you can just go right there. So next, let's hook up billing. So GCP costs money. So companies pay us money uh, to basically use these tools. But as students, as, we all, uh, as was mentioned before, um, we have these free credits that we can use to use these tools for free to get started. So these coupons each have a code on the bottom in the, in the uh, I guess that's like an orange hue. Um, and so the way that you enter these is you go to console.cloud.google.com, same as before, but you do slash edu. So that's console.cloud.google.com slash edu. And so you go to this page, and you see that there's a little form specific to education grants. And these are the ones that we have here. And so what we do is we enter this code. So I'm going to do this live right now. 19LL. So we can all enter these together. And then once I'm done entering it, instead of the red, we see this credit amount, expiration date, and course. So Michael, where are you? Wave to us. Hey, Michael. Michael's name is on the board. Um, <laughs> so now we have this uh, coupon code. One quick thing, oftentimes, if you're at an event and you have these codes and you're handing them out, people will say, oh, like this code is still red, even though they're done typing. The first thing that they probably did was they just had a typo. But otherwise, it could be that they already used the coupon or they already entered it. And so if you ever need to debug that problem, it's probably one of those two things. They either mistyped it or they already used that code. And so for country of residence, I'm just going to say US. And then please email me updates. So these are not like very annoying marketing updates. They're actually things specific to education. So I love education, and I'm going to click yes, as you all love education. Um, and then I click accept and continue. So what this does is it creates what's called a billing account. And so the, the idea of a billing account versus a project, are, they're kind of two different things. So every project needs a billing account hooked up to it. But I can have one billing account that's hooked up to several projects. So let's say I enter my credit card. And I have one project for like a side project I'm doing, and then another one for a class project. I can have that one billing account tied to these multiple projects. And so the way that you hook them up to the actual project is you click on this drop down menu right at the top. And then you go down to Manage Billing Accounts. 
And then, so now we're on the manage billing accounts. And then up here we see, I'll zoom in a little, we see my billing accounts and my projects. Right now we want to go to the projects so that we can specify what billing account we want to use. So we go to my projects, and over here we see this is the project that I just spun up, Daring Diode. Yeah. Really quick, if anyone's having trouble uh, when they're trying to create a new project and it's saying organization and there's the red text, um, what that means, without getting into specifics, um, try using your personal Gmail account. Um, some people's school domains, like your .edu account, aren't activated to use GCP. And so use your personal Gmail if that's the case. Um, and then once you've done that, if you're still having issues, raise your hand and we'll come and try and help you. Cool. Yeah, and that's also a very good point, Michael. That's something that a lot of the people at your school will also face. We run into this with faculty all the time. And so if, if that is an issue, that means that your G Suite administrator, so like the IT people at your school, didn't allow GCP to be used in this, um, in this organization. So if you just use your Gmail account, everything will be fine. So we're here, and right now this is already hooked up to the billing account because I already had one. But for you to add a billing account, you click on this dot, dot, dot thing, and you click change billing account, and then you can just pick one. So this says no billing accounts available because I already have one. But you'd click on that, um, dot, dot, dot. You'd click change billing account, and then you'd click the actual billing account that you want to hook it up to, which would be called Michael Hamamoto or something. And so now we go back to our uh, project, and we have a billing account in here, and we have our project set up. So let's actually do something in here. Let's actually build a resource. So we're going to do what's called spinning up a VM. So we're just going to create a virtual machine. And for those of you who don't know what a virtual machine is, it's basically like an abstraction away from an actual computer. So you all have computers in front of you, and they all have CPUs in them. That's actually running the code. So we have a bunch of CPUs at GCP, but we don't sell those exactly. We sell what's called a virtual machine, which is running on this actual CPU. So we can have like three or four VMs running on one CPU, and they're kind of separated operating systems. So we're going to do that. First thing we're going to do is click on the top left hamburger menu. So this is like if you ever need anything, you just click on this, and it's probably there. This is like the answer to all of my problems ever. Um, I, that's not exactly true, but I hope it was. Um, so you're over here. As you can see, a lot of the tools I spoke about earlier, like I am an admin and um, App Engine and storage and all these things, they're all here. So if you ever want to use one of these tools, you click on the hamburger menu, and then you scroll down to it and find it there. What we're going to do now, though, we're going to use Compute Engine, which is like when shorthand, you would just say GCE. So you go to Compute Engine, you just click on that, and then it says Compute Engine is getting ready. So as you can see, there's like a lot of times when GCP is just kind of propagating data through its systems. And so that's what it's doing right now. It's just getting ready for us. But once that happens, then we can just get ready and do that. And again, I see like people are continuing to raise their hands. Keep doing that. Um, our helpers are running around and help answering questions. Um, so yeah, just keep your hand up if, if you have a question. And they'll get to you. So we are still waiting and waiting. But once it gets ready, we will continue. Anybody have a joke? I guess that was kind of a joke. Nice. We did it. Oh, you have a joke? Yeah. yeah go for it. Why does Waldo wear stripes? Why does Waldo wear stripes? I, I don't. Let's give that a round of applause. That was really something. OK, so I'm going to refresh and then see if that helped. So it's still getting ready. We have time for one more joke, I think. Anybody? Oh, we got one over here, yeah. Stand up for us. What's your name? It's more like a joke that I wouldn't want to attached to. OK, then you sure you want to say it? What was that? What about, uh, oh, not going to repeat that one. <laughs> OK, so this is still getting ready. Let's go to a, uh, do I have a different project? So is anybody's ready? OK, cool. It's ready. OK, so who is ready right now? Awesome. That's like a little bit of the crowd. Um, and then I'm also going to point you to a tutorial for this later on after this. Um, so if you fall behind, you could just go through that as well. Um, 
So basically right now, we click on Create. And this is basically the form that will help us create this instance. So the first thing we need to do is zoom in. But then after we're done zooming in, we specify the name of the instance. So I'm just going to leave this as, uh, as it is, instance one. I could make this Armand's instance. So I guess I'm not going to leave it as temp instance. Anyway, it's called Armand's instance now. And then now we select the region, which basically means where in the world this computer is actually going to sit. So you can tell it, if, you, if you're in London and your tool and all your users are in London, and you want this computer to actually be closer to them because of like, actual networking speed, then you could spin it up in London. For now, I am in uh, South I'm not in South Carolina, actually. Um, I want to go to US West. So let's go LA. And then you could specify the actual zone, which is like uh, one level deeper than region. And then now we click on the machine type. So we can click anything from micro, which is like a very, very small computer, all the way up to, wow, 96 CPUs. That is something. Um, so I'm just going to go lightweight and click one CPU. And I'm not going to deploy a container engine. I'm just going to spin up this uh, operating system, which is a Debian operating system. But also what you can do here is you can specify a specific what's called image, so a, spe a specific operating system with certain things installed. So you can specify that and spin up a VM with all of that already configured. And so for security courses, for example, a lot of times teachers will say, hey, go to this virtual machine. It has an old version of some operating system. Try to break into it. And so if you have uh, like courses like that at your school, you can easily tell the professor, hey, this is an idea that you might be able to use. Um, and then the rest of it, I'm just going to skip. But there's also other settings that you can set, like all down here. Um, and I'm just going to click Create. So this actually takes a hot second. So I'm going to um, open up a new tab and show you about that tutorial that I was talking about. So I open a new tab, and I go to, um, what is it, uh, Code Labs. Dot develop, let's just Google Code Labs. So it's codelabs.developers.google.com. So again, codelabs.developers.google.com. And so this page is going to be very, very useful to you. So who are the returning student innovators in the room? Awesome. How many of you have used a Code Lab? Awesome. So that's almost everybody. So Code Labs are basically tutorials that step you through how to, use and how to use a specific tool and perform a specific task. So in this case, we wanted to spin up a virtual machine. So if you type in virtual machine, you can start this code lab. So you can start create a virtual machine. And what this basically does, starts with an overview, and then you go to setup and requirements, and it basically walks you through exactly what you need to do to create a code lab, including the cleanup. So like how to delete it. And so these are really good for if you're holding a session where you, you invite some students and you want to teach them about a specific tool. I know Zeeshan's done this a bunch. So I recommend you all use this tool a lot. And if you fell behind, you could easily come here and uh, continue with the code lab on your own. And so with that, the instance has been created. So we click into that. And now we, we have a computer. So we can SSH into it. And what this basically means is it just opens up a console where I'm literally writing code in the dock, I mean, in, in the uh, virtual machine. And so it connects uh, SSH keys to the VM. It is connecting. And now I can do anything. So I can say uh, I can make a file called hello world.py. I can go in there and I can say print, oh no, print. Hello world. Save that. And then I can say Python, hello world.py, and it runs the code. So you can do anything in these computers. You can set up a server on these computers. You can do literally anything. You can train a, com uh, a model, like a machine learning model on there. So they're very, very powerful. And then to close it, you just click X and leave. And then now, let's clean this up. So we don't want to run out of our entire $100 credit. So we want to go to the top right and just click Delete. And that will delete the instance that we just created. And so that's how we clean up uh, what we just did. And so I recommend that you tell all of your, uh, the people that you're working with to clean up their projects afterwards so that they're not billed. So 
That is that. Cool. So that's all for the demo. Um, so if we could just go back to the slide deck. So now let's just do a little bit of a recap. So we started out telling the story of on-prem to cloud. We gave a little bit of history and kind of tied all the loose ends of how we actually got here. Then we, we talked about the three different umbrellas of cloud, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. Then we talked about GCP versus G Suite. So we broke up the infrastructure and platform as a service under GCP, and we said G Suite covers the software as a service side. We also talked about GCP's tools and use cases by going through the different uh, areas that GCP covers and wrapping up how both companies and students use these tools in meaningful ways. And lastly, as we just did, we tried it. We actually opened up our laptops, we walked through the code, and we spun up a virtual machine. So that is all for me. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, I think we have a little bit of time left, so you all can continue working and trying to finish up that uh, demo that we just did. But I want to thank you all for listening to me. Right on. Thanks, Armand. We appreciate it. All right, everyone, we are back on time. It's very exciting. So as we move into lunch, we are eating at the time that we had planned to eat lunch at, which is very exciting. Uh, you can actually leave your stuff in the room if you want. Uh, we have security. Maybe lock your screens. Don't just like leave it totally unlocked. But you can leave your stuff in the room if you want. Um, you're going to be eating lunch upstairs, same place you had breakfast. You'll be, hold on a minute. You'll be eating with real life Google engineers, so actually being able to interact with them and learn from them. There is no assigned seating, so make sure you sit with people that look like they are going to be interesting, which I can assure you they all will be. And lastly, uh, we will see you in an hour. So 10 to 1 is when you'll be here. Be safe upstairs as you eat food. I mean, don't run each other over. Perfect. Have a good one. <laughs>